Everyone going to be able to? All right. Why don't we uh, open in a word of prayer and we'll we'll get started. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, we thank you for uh, tonight. We thank you again for all of the insights that Peter has given us. Um, and particularly tonight, as he warns us against false teachers that infiltrate our uh, society and our churches. And we pray, Lord, that uh, you give me the words tonight that you would like these folks to hear. We ask this in your name. Amen. Amen. Well, I, when I was in Israel uh, this past summer, I got a chance to visit the Israeli National Museum in Jerusalem. And it was a tremendous place to really learn about the history of Israel. And one of the exhibits they had there was the story of a gentleman named Eli Cohen. And he was born in the Jewish quarter of Alexandria, Egypt in 1924, the son of a Jewish silk tie maker. He was a great student. He became fluent in many languages. There was a war that broke out in Egypt and it caused him to kind of get drawn into the political causes. And he ultimately found himself involved with the Egyptian branch of the Mossad. Now, if you don't know what the Mossad is, that's the Israeli intelligence agency, kind of like our CIA. And ultimately, he became the perfect spy. He was strong uh, with a tie to Israel, but he maintained an outstanding credential as an Egyptian. In 1961, he went to Damascus, Syria, to pose as a wealthy Arab businessman with holdings in Buenos Aires, Argentina. He became engaged in the import-export business and he took an expensive apartment in Damascus and began giving large sums of money to Syrian politicians, which gave him entree into the highest political social circles. He became a regular guest at presidential palace parties, and he soon became a personal confidant of most government leaders, which gave him access to high level briefings at the Syrian Israeli border. And meanwhile, he was funneling all this information back to Israel. Well, there was a problem. There was water from Galilee. And again, quickly, um, Israel is a parched land. There's a lot of water in the northern part of Israel. And what they do is they pipe it down into the southern portions where there isn't as much water. So it had to run through a place called the Golan Heights, which was controlled by Syria. And what Syria planned to do was to blow up that water pipe, thereby uh, depriving Israel in the southern part of the water. So Cohen found out about that. And he told the Israelis, Israelis what to do. Um, the Syrians were going to dis destroy the water flow. And at about the same time that Cohen convinced President al-Hafiz to plant eucalyptus trees at major military installations across the Golan Heights. Now, that seems like an odd thing to do. But he claimed the trees would provide great air cover and shield the installations from the Israeli air surveillance. So the king agreed. And all of these trees were planted along the Golan Heights. In 1965, Cohen was exposed as a spy and was hanged in the town square of Damascus. A few months later, during the Six Day War, Israeli fighter pilots knocked out every Syrian military target on the Golan Heights. They were marked by eucalyptus trees. The Golan Heights today are controlled by Israel because Eli Cohen's work as a spy and his approach, pose as one of them and lead them to tragedy. And as we tonight, when we go into Peter and warn, he warns us of the same thing. He says false teachers that come into the church setting and pose as Christians, but in reality, they're only there to mislead the church members in their spiritual walk. Tonight's scripture is 2 Peter chapter 2, and I've entitled A Portrait of False Teachers and broken it into three sections. The first is 2 Peter 2, 1 through 3, a sketch of false teachers. 2 Peter 2, 3 through 10, the fate of the false teacher. And then thirdly, 2 Peter 2, 11 through 22, false teachers in living color. So let's start with the sketch of the false teachers. Peter does a good job of kind of breaking this passage down. He saved some of his harshest criticisms in his two epistles for false teachers. He knows that these individuals are sent by Satan to deceive people in the church. Satan always has endeavored to infiltrate God's people with those who say they speak for God, but in actuality speak for Satan. And likewise, God has always warned his people against these individuals, even to the point of having false teachers put to death in the Old Testament. 
If you look at Deuteronomy 13, or even in the New Testament in 2 Corinthians 11, it talks about them being stoned. And it's always the false teachers that come as righteous and truthful servants, teachers of God, if you will. But in reality, they come to destroy the plan of God. Paul called them false apostles, deceitful workers, disguised as angels of light, but in truth, they're angels of darkness. And what is Peter is telling his readers is not to tolerate these individuals. Tolerance produces indifference to the truth. In other words, don't let them get a foothold in your church. Satan's goal is to falsify God's truth from inside the church through people who call themselves Christians but deceive and distort and ultimately damn people to hell who think they have the truth when they really don't. An interesting point, you don't see false teachers in the pagan world. They're always embedded in the church because Satan is trying to derail Christ's plan. So Peter takes this chapter too to describe how false teachers look and act and function within the church. And his description is parallel than Jude. If you read that, they're almost identical, kind of the information that's there. And Peter's point to his readers, if you know the truth, you won't be deceived. Now, when you go back and look at chapter one, or you go back and look at first Peter, you, you basically, Peter is educating you on how to be more intelligent so that you'll be able to discern who is a false teacher and who is telling you the truth. And he'll do it again in chapter three. In, in Second Peter, to know about our sanctification, and how do we, again, know about our salvation, and how do we grow in that salvation? It's interesting, when this starts, the first word is but, and if you look at it, it really is just a continuation of chapter one of, of uh, Second Peter, and it's the script, it's basically says, the scripture was written by the spirit, filled individual, okay, so in other words, that way we closed last week, is that Peter was saying, we know it's the scripture, and it was breathed by God. It was the Holy Spirit talking to the authors about what to say. But what it says now is, but Satan also has his own prophets, just as God has his. So he's starting off by saying, beware, right? There's going to be people that are going to try to twist that truth and tell you different things. And it, the point is, the false teacher don't operate in the pagan environment. They gain positions of power and prominence in Christianity. So we see Satan at work already. The church catches kind of the flavor of the culture. They want their ears tickled, as Isaiah says it. They move away from sound doctrine, which includes reproof, rebuke, exhortation. When somebody hears that, boy, I'm not sure I really want that in my Christian walk. They want to avoid, avoid confrontation. Tell us pleasant things is very often what the congregation will say. Say things that are good. Tell us things that make us feel good about ourselves. Tell us what we want to hear. Concern for things about God recedes. Instead, they become concerned with having their needs met. They want their egos fed. Be made to feel good about themselves. So they go out and accumulate a mass of teachers who feed their desires. That's how it gets a foothold right, is that people don't know the truth, they don't know the full extent of what it means to be a Christian, and they welcome in people that make Christianity seem a lot easier than it is. And as a result, their ears are turned away from the truth, and now they're wide open to Satan's influence. That's how it gets started. They secretly bring in false doctrine. They don't come in wearing a name tag that says, I'm a false teacher. They come in basically wearing sheep's clothing. That's what a shepherd would wear. That's what a prophet would wear in the Old Testament, right? So they basically come in under the guise of someone who has knowledge or has an understanding of the, of the scriptures that they're going to share with this congregation. And then they smuggle in deceptive false doctrine. They position themselves as Christians and pastors and teachers. And again, what Peter's talking about here are, are, are those that are called libertines, right? And, and the church can't tolerate these types of opinions. These teachers come in with their own humanly devised stuff, and they fracture and divide and split the church. Meanwhile, those that oppose these falsehoods are often pushed aside. Think about it yourself. If I could tell you that you can be a Christian, will believe in Jesus, will believe in his resurrection, will believe in his ascension, will believe in the atonement for our sins. But guess what? You don't have to become a servant of God. 
you can just live whatever life you want. Wouldn't that seem more attractive than having to be obedient and each day kind of follow the way and the truth of what God is saying? See, that's what they do as they kind of make their way in. They make Christianity seem alluring, but in a different way than the way that God intended it. And that's how they get a foothold. These false teachers can be recognized because they characteristically say no to the master who brought them. That's what it said in the first couple of verses. No to the master who brought them. You know what that means? That's Christ. They deny the sovereignty of Christ. They deny maybe his virgin birth, they, his perfection, his deity, his atoning sacrifice, his bodily resurrection, his ascension, his second coming. There's some twist in the gospel message that they distort and they then teach that as being truth. Right? But Peter describes false teachers who deny the sovereign lordship. They don't deny the deity of Christ, but they say no to his lordship. What does he mean by that? He means they don't sacrifice their lives to him. They don't become bond servants of Christ. They don't follow in obedience to what Christ says you must do if you are a Christian and a follower of him. So they make it appealing. They don't yield their lives to him. It's not their theology that identifies them but it's their morality that identifies them. They say no to submitting their lives to Christ. And that's what Peter is telling these people to be aware of. Follow their lives, see what they do. Don't listen to just their words, look at their morals, see how they, they conduct their life, right? And now the result is a swift destruction, death, right? That's the point is the person's life doesn't demonstrate submission to Christ. They name Christ with their lips, but they refuse his lordship in their lives. Immediately, that should be an identification to you as someone who is, is being infiltrated by these people to say, no, that's not, what, that's not what we want here. And a strong church will eradicate those people and not let them get a foothold. But unfortunately, many of them will follow their sensuality and they preach an attractive form of Christianity, a Christianity that knows nothing about submission to Christ. It's basically saying they can have Christ and still have sin. So it says they, they come and they have sensuality. There's a sexual immorality. There's a depraved contact. They, they want to feed their lust. There's no restraint on fleshly desires and sexual indulgences. It's all covered by grace would be what, what they would say. Don't get in the way of my lifestyle. I'm a Christian, but I, I want to do what I want to do. And grace and salvation basically that's without obedience. And that's not something that Jesus teaches. So immediately Peter is saying, this is false. Now you ask, why is Peter getting so dogmatic? These are the strongest words that he's had in, in both of his epistles. Well, you remember when he was reinstated, what did Jesus say to him? Peter, do you love me? And Peter said, of course, I love you. What did he say? Feed my sheep. He said it a second time. He said it a third time. See, Peter is taking responsibility. He's saying, These, this is my congregation. These are my sheep. And I see here wolves that are coming in to try to devour my sheep. So he doesn't hold back. He really lays into these people as being false. It basically says that eventually they're going to be exposed. And the world mocks Christianity because there's a stigma on Christianity because of them. Christianity is discredited. Greed is the driving force. It's money. They con money out of anyone. They carry on business to make a profit. Their message is molded to deceive you. God is going to damn false teachers, and this way is, was established long ago. And he's saying their sentence hasn't been weakened by time. Their executioner is fully awake. Now, you may sit there and say, you know what? I'm not worried about this. I can, I can identify a false teacher. And, you know, I thought that as well until I got involved three years ago with Ravi Zacharias. Many of you know that I'm on a board of a Christian camp in upstate New York, and each week they have a speaker come in to give seven messages to the, to the campers that are there. And Ravi Zacharias was one of those speaking. And about three years ago, we got word, um, there was a Christianity Today article that talked about a potential impropriety in Ravi Zacharias' life. One of his donors was exchanging pictures with him, accusing him of exchanging pictures with him that weren't very edifying. And before we let him get up, I called the board uh, of Ravi Zacharias Ministries and saying, what is your official stance on this? Have you guys looked into this? And they came back assuring us 
that Ravi Zacharias was clean, and this was somebody that was just trying to extort money from him. The day before he spoke, we had dinner. There were four of us on the board, and Ravi and his wife, and we said, we have to ask you about these things that are going on. And I remember the look in his face when he denied explicitly that he was involved in any type of impropriety. He looked hurt. He looked um, that, that, why would you challenge me on something like this? Of course you believe me, I'm a man of God. And so he went and he spoke. And by the way, he gave seven of the most uh, powerful messages I think that I've ever heard on Christianity. But you know what happened two years later? It happened again. And when people dug into it, it found out that there was a whole nother side of Ravi Zacharias's life that included sexual immorality. And as they dug further, there was, there was problems with the books where he was diverting money to support some of the lifestyle that he was living that was ungodly. And the result was it destroyed his ministry. It destroyed his ministry and it destroyed the reputation of many of the pastors that worked in his ministry that were innocent, but just by association, they're not able to work today because of that. That's what a false teacher does. It comes saying that there are witnesses for Christ, that they believe in Christ, that they're there, but the lifestyle doesn't hold up to it. And if you want to think back, when Satan sees this type of thing happen, do you think he was having a great day when Ravi Zacharias was exposed? Because Christianity was thwarted. It got a black eye because of that. Thwarted is too strong of a word. It, it got a black eye. People were mocking Christianity because here was a guy that was heralded as one of the great speakers of the Christian faith, and here he fell. Think of Jim and Tammy Baker, right? Think of what's going on at Liberty University with the president that's there. Every time that happens, that's a false teacher that's embedded themselves into those organizations and later is exposed for what they really are. That's what Peter's worried about here. That's what Peter is warning his congregants to be aware, to be smart, to be crafty and understand the word, to kind of study it so that you can value, to observe a lifestyle of what somebody is saying and what they're really doing. That's why he is, is so dogmatic about them understanding what's taking place. But let's look at the fate of the false teacher. Verse one tells us that false teachers bring destruction upon themselves. Although the destruction or judgment may not yet have occurred, Peter tells us that their judgment was planned long ago. So the judgment is coming for them. Why? Because God, by his nature, is a God of truth. He'll judge all liars and deceivers, especially those who say they speak for him, but don't truthfully treat, teach his word. He didn't spare the angels, right, when they sinned. He gives three examples, right? So the angels were tossed out of heaven. So the implication here is don't worry about these false teachers being punished. If God punished the third of the angels that were there when Satan rebelled, don't you think he's going to punish these false teachers, right? Satan wanted to be equal with God, and he led the rebellion, and those angels were thrown out of heaven. The point is, if God didn't spare the greater angelic beings who were his special creation when they perverted his truth and when they spread corruption, they, then won't he judge false teachers who are lesser beings who lead people to believe lies about him and his word, who are just trying to, trying to destroy his redemptive purposes, right? That's what he's saying. So then the second thing he says is, you know, then what about Moab, uh, Noah and the time there? He didn't spare the ancient world, right? There were millions of people that were there, but he preserved Noah, right, with seven others when he brought a flood upon the world of the ungodly. Why would he then spare the lesser number of false teachers if he was willing to destroy the world with those people that were sinning? If God's so committed to truth and so committed to righteousness that he would drown the entire world, why should we believe that he would spare the lesser group? A smaller group of false prophets who have lived the same way, corrupting his truth and living in unrighteousness. So he brought a flood upon the world of the ungodly, just like the false prophets who bring swift destruction upon themselves the ungodly living in Noah's time brought it upon themselves as well. The point is, in the midst of the cataclysm, God preserved Noah. Can you imagine the readers hearing this, these examples, and saying, am I going to be destroyed with these false teachers because they're in my church? So Peter, knowing that, basically, and inspired by the Holy Spirit, says, no, God knows the righteous. Just like he saved Noah and his family, he's going to save. He knows which ones are righteous and which ones are corrupt. 
And then he does the same thing with Sodom and Gomorrah, right? He condemned Sodom and Gomorrah to destruction by reducing them to ashes, right? That was a sentence that was executed on the wicked. Why? They had rejected his truth and followed liars, false teachers. He made an example to those who would live ungodly lives after that. Remember what was going on in Sodom and Gomorrah? Rampant homosexuality to the point where they even went after the angels that had come to destroy the city. And again, God saved the righteous. I'm not sure I would classify Lot as a righteous man, but what God has said is that the sin gnawed at him. It bothered him to the point where it, it, it disrupted his life. And so he was the only one that was righteous. So he and his wife and two daughters were escorted out of Sodom and Gomorrah before it was destroyed. So again, God understanding who are the false teachers, where is the sin, and destroying that, but saving the righteous. And that would, I think, encourage the people in Peter's day that were reading this letter. God knows how to judge the wicked, and he knows how to rescue the righteous. He knows how to save those who belong to him, and they have nothing to fear. That must have been encouraging for the readers of, of this, this particular chapter. Finally, when we go in and look at the false teachers in living color, this is where Peter really takes the gloves off. I mean, he goes after these people and unloads in these last verses. He calls the false teachers animals who have no rational capability. They operate solely on self-indulgence, react only on instinct, and make no intellectual contribution to the life of man. They're only good to die to sustain the life of another creature. Basically, they're on the food chain, and that's the the only thing they're good for. He's saying that false teachers are equally mindless and equally self-indulgent, and they serve men best when they're dead. Those are pretty powerful words, if you think mm -hmm. about it, right? Peter got it from Jesus. We said this before, feed my sheep. He's ticked off about these false shepherds feeding his sheep poison, and he's the true shepherd, and he's now guiding and directing these people. And this chapter is to arm his church on how to recognize false teachers and how God views them. And he goes through a series of kind of adjectives to describe them. He says they're presumptuous, right? They don't tremble when they revile angelic majesties. Well, that's an interesting thing. It says they're so brazen that they give no thought to the consequences of what they're doing. They know no restraint. They're stubborn, right? They blaspheme and ridicule angelic beings. And, and what he's talking about here are the fallen angels, right? They ridicule fallen angels. There's a glorious persona that these angels still possess, but they, basically they're blaspheming them. They're, they have the imprint of God on them. They, they've fallen, but they're still greater than man. And these false teachers are so arrogant and so presumptuous that they don't even worry about blaspheming these people. That's how misguided they are. And they underestimate the power of Satan. They basically believe they're stronger than the angels, and they mock them, and they assume there'll be no retaliation since they view them as insignificant, right? And, and Peter is saying here, even the, the regular angels, the good angels, don't ridicule the bad angels. And he gives an example of, of Michael in Deuteronomy 34 arguing with Satan over Moses' body. And he said he didn't mock him. He didn't blaspheme him. He basically rebuked him to God. So if these good angels are not mocking or having the presumption to be better than the bad angels, then why would these false teachers do it? So it's a negative attribute that he's giving to them. It says they're going to be abandoned to destruction. They're going to consume others, and they themselves will be consumed. They'll get what they deserve. It says they, they count it as a pleasure to revel in the daytime. The false teacher's sin is so great that they don't even constrain their activities to the darkness of night. Peter you know, looks at this and he says they follow their sensuality and their passion and their greed 24-7. That's how misguided they are. They have no truth to kind of put boundaries on their lifestyle. And these are the people that are now in the church. And these are the people that are now preying on those that are immature Christians or are vulnerable or seeking the truth. And, and again, they're coming in and misleading them into a way that is, is not going to give them salvation. Peter calls them filth or dirt spots that revel in their deceptions. They're living in sinful pleasure while deceiving those under their influence into the same sinful activities. And when they show up for church celebrations, they pollute it, but they fit right in. 
right? They, they are so bad that they can't look upon women without looking at them as, as a possible adulteress with them. And this is what Jesus said in Matthew 5, 28. He said, if a man looks on a woman to lust after her, he's committed adultery in his heart. These guys were greedy. They were doing it for money and they were doing it for sensual pleasures. That means they were trying to entice women into sexual immorality. These are people that are representing themselves as, as prophets or teachers of the word of God. In this case, Peter says it's out of control. They never pause from sin. They entice other people to behave like this, usually a weaker individual, younger in faith, or an unbeliever. It's a heart that's trained in greed, trained in greed. The word that he uses is gymnasium. They go and work out and get better at being greedy. They're in it for personal gain. They want sexual favors. They want money. They want possessions, and they want power. And these are the people that are embedding themselves in the church. And that's why Peter's saying they're accursed and damned to hell. It says they have followed Balaam. We had some fun with that in our small group tonight talking about that. But basically, Balaam was the first false teacher. He was a prophet. He was given the power to speak for God. But he did it for money. Right. And, and when the Moabites wanted to kind of defeat the Israelites, they came in and talked to Balak, the king. Balak the king talked to, to, uh, to Balaam and he said, I want you to put a curse on Israel so I can defeat him. I'll pay you. And again, Balaam, being deceptive, basically said, well, you see, Balak, I have to speak the truth. I'm a man of God, right? What he was doing was jacking the price up, right? He was trying to get him to give a higher bid of money for him to put the curse on Israel. And if you read the story, you understand that, that God prevented Balaam from putting the curse. He used the talking donkey. Right. We thought we had Mr. Ed. They had the talking donkey long before Mr. Ed. Right. And, and the donkey basically said to him, you know what? I'm protecting you from yourself. There's an angel of God right there that would have killed you if I hadn't moved off the path. And here you are beating me with a stick. Right. So God put a blessing on Israel instead of a curse. But you know what? Balaam didn't kind of say, all right, well, I guess I missed out on that opportunity. He still was greedy. So what he did was he basically went back to Balak, the king, and he said, you know what? I've got another way that you can, you can thwart Israel. Why don't you induce them to come into sexual immorality? Why don't you invite them to the Moabite festivals that include orgies? Why don't you intermarry them with some of your women? Why don't you give them meat that's been offered to idols, right? And that actually worked to the point that you had mass scale Israelites marrying Moabite women which again was taking him away from, from the people of God. And so he was a false teacher. And what ended up happening is Moses got involved and killed all the Moabites and he, he killed Balaam as well. But look at the pattern, right? Greed, look at the pattern, sexual immorality, right? It was, it was those same things that Balaam did that Peter is warning his people now of saying, these are the things you have to avoid that are coming into your church. So what are false teachers? What's the summary for these guys? They intentionally stray from the truth of God. Think about that. At one point, they were searching, just like a non-Christian is looking for, for salvation. They were looking for the same thing, but they accepted error rather than healthy doctrine. They heard the truth, and they said, mm, I'm going to change that around a little bit. Why? Because I want to make money. They're in it for money, and they're in it for sexual gratification. So they're bastardizing the word of God for their own personal benefit. And then they encourage others to follow the same path. Their teaching is barren. It says springs without water, mist driven by the storm. Peter's readers would have really understood that. And again, being in Israel this summer, you, you have these, these large swaths of Israel that are just desert. And what they do is on the top of a mountain, when the water hits, Kind of one side it flows down and you have this lush green you know pasture like land but on the other side the water kind of seeps down into the sandstone and then it's called what they call a wadi which is almost like a little rivulet of water that kind of goes down and you know how you see them is that, th that you have these green lush trees that follow it all the way down and the rest is desert and that's what the shepherds would look for when they were taking their flocks for water they would look for that green growth because they knew there was a spring but what Peter is saying is when you follow that, you get to that spring, it's dry. And he's comparing that to the teaching of these false prophets, that you think it's the truth and you follow it and then you have an empty spring. So they would have understood that. And then he talks about the mist. Same thing. 
the, the, the arid climate on the desert side, basically when they, there's a, a mist there, usually a storm comes in behind it, but because of the, the temperature of the desert, it pushes it over the mountain and that's where the rains fall. So they would see the mist and they would say, this is great, we're gonna get rain, we're gonna be able to you know, capture water, but it never materializes. The same as the false teachers, right? They give you this hope that there's gonna be water and when they get there, there's no storm, there's no rain, it's just parched. And Peter gives a great example to the people that would have read that, that they would have understood it. And it says they particularly prey on those who want to clean up their lives and have turned to religion. These are the young people that are coming in, the people that have finally gotten so tired of their life that they said, I want to try religion. And they walk into the church and they're hoping to hear the truth. And guess who's there to greet them? The false teacher right? And the false teacher takes them down this road and says, this is the religion that you want. This is the one that's going to tickle your ears. And if they don't have anything to fall back on or don't understand it, they basically then become strays and, and away from the true word of God. And Peter concludes, and he says it, it would have been better for these false teachers if they had never known the way of Christianity. Better not to have known it and understood it and then reject it. All they can look forward to is judgment and fire, the most severe punishment in hell. Remember when Jesus approached Judas on the night he betrayed him? He said it would have been better if you were never born because you're going you're gonna to spend eternity in hell. And that's the same thing he's saying about these false teachers, right? That they have no place in heaven and that they are cursed because of what they're doing. Last week, we talked about sheep. And we talked about that they weren't the most intelligent animals that God ever created. And I, I shared with you the story about how I went to a sheep factory, I guess we would call it. And I told you about the side where they sheared the sheep and cleaned the wool and packed it and sent it. But there's another side of it. That's where they go to slaughter. And you know what's interesting? What they do is, is when the sheep know, they have a sense that something's wrong, they just kind of sit down and they don't do anything. And they can't move them. And it frustrates those that are trying to you know, get them through so they can get them into the slaughterhouse. So you know what they do? They have a sheep that is a castrated male sheep who lead the unwitting sheep to the killing floor. And all this thing does is it gets in front of these stupid animals that then all pop up and follow them. Why? They're unaware of what's going to happen. The sheep blindly follow and they believe they're being led to food and leading them to rest, which is what they crave. And they follow them right to their death. And as they approach the killing floor, a trap door opens and the lead sheep slides down a ramp to go back to the pen and lead another group of sheep to slaughter. And the sheep, you know what they call the sheep? They call it the Judas sheep, right? And the parallel is so clear. Peter wants his readers to understand the danger of following one who doesn't have their best interests at heart and is leading them to death. And how do we do that? Well, reread chapter one, reread uh, ch chapter one of second Peter, or review all the things in first Peter that are needed to become a mature in Christ and to set our defenses against the false teacher or anything <coughs> that is not a true representation of God's holy word. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for Peter's words. We thank you, Lord, for giving us insight into what is a characteristic look like of a false teacher. And Lord, we can say, well, we know what they would look like. We're prepared. We know the word well enough. But yet we see it over and over in scripture. We see Peter talk about it. We see Paul talk about it. We see Jesus talk about it. We see what it was like in the Old Testament. Lord, they've always been here and we are not protected from that. And Lord, may we search the scriptures so that we understand exactly what it means to be a Christian and that we will confront those who come in with anything that's different than, than what we're told in, in your word. And Lord, to do that, it means we have to apply ourselves, that we have to rely on the Holy Spirit to give us interpretation of, of hard scripture passage that we may not understand. But Lord, through that, we know we're being guided to be more like you become bond servants to you and to obey the laws that you've given us as we become a Christian. And we thank you, Lord, that we have that foundational knowledge that we can then ward off any type of false teacher that may try to infiltrate our lives or the lives of those that we know in church. We ask this in your name. Amen. Amen.
Thank you, Jack. Thank you, Thank you Jack. Jack. Thanks, Jack. Right. Thanksgiving, everyone. Thank you, Jack. Jack. Bye, everyone. Man. Happy Thanksgiving.